it's time to begin. Our past time to begin. I keep waiting for the buzzer to sound. And I realize because the time change, it's not going to until it's changed. And so Mike is going to work on that right now. But that's the, the reason it hasn't gone off yet. But we're time to begin. We're going to continue in our study of the book of Numbers. We're going to be in chapter 9, 10, 11, maybe chapter 12 in our study uh, this morning. But before we get started, we want to go to God in the word of prayer. So if you'll please bow with me at this time. Our wonderful God and Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day and the opportunity that you provided for us to open up our Bibles and study together. We're grateful, Father, for the place that we have to come together and meet. We're grateful, Father, for every individual that's present here this morning. We pray, Father, to help us in our study to make application of thy word to our lives. We pray, Father, that we would learn from the example of men like Moses. We learn from mistakes that the people of Israel made and Moses and others made that we might avoid those in our own in our own lives. We pray, Father, at this time for forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Father, that we'll stand clean and pure as we enter our period of study. We pray, Father, that you would uh, be with those of our number that are sick, that they might get well and be able to be back with us soon. And we pray, Father, for those that have recently lost loved ones. We pray, Father, your comfort upon the Jedon families and upon the Sharp families. We pray, Father, that they might find comfort in thee and thy word at this time. Continue with us through this hour of study. Continue with us in our worship. We pray, Father, that all that we do would be pleasing in thy sight. For this we ask in your son's blessed name. The book of Numbers, as we've already noted, is, is really divided into uh, to two or three sections, depending on how you want to outline it. The first ten uh, chapters or so are dealing with the preparation for the journey, the going into, uh, the, going into the, the, the promised land. I was supposed to remind you all your teacher's not going to be here. How about get out of the Yeah. I'm a little bit behind on my views, so... Uh, but Ben's out of town. We'll be for the next couple of weeks, so y'all stay in the auditorium until, until they get back. Uh, so we've got the preparation for the journey, numbers 1 through 10. Then you've got the, the beginning of that journey to the promised land, really in 11 and 12 and 13, before you have the wandering in the wilderness in chapter 14 after their period of disobedience. So we're still really in that period of the that, that period of the preparation. And as we said in chapter 7 through 9, it sort of all centers around the tabernacle and the, the offerings that are brought, the preparation, the Levites, uh, the Passovers observed in, involving the tabernacle, and the appearance of the cloud of God's guidance over the tabernacle. And we were in chapter 9, and I think we mentioned this content just very briefly. I want to break a couple more things out in chapter 9. The Passover observance in chapter in verses 1 through verse 14, and then the cloud and the fire above the tabernacle in 15 to 23. We said that this is the second Passover. So how long has it been since they left Egypt? It's been one year. Since it's in the second year, it's one year since they have left Egypt. And now they're observing this Passover really for the first time in remembrance of their deliverance. You think about it, the first time that it had been observed, it was more of an anticipation of their deliverance in the Passover. So now it's really the first time that they've observed it looking back at that deliverance. And a couple of things that, that, that stand out. Number one, they come together and God says they are to observe it. But one of the things I wanted to bring out were these men that came and said, we are defiled. We can't observe it. What are we going to do? This is in verse 6 through verse 8. And I wanted to point out some commendable traits in these men. We sometimes may just sort of pass over this. Here are these unclean men that can't observe the Passover. But I want you to notice at least three things about these men that ought to serve as an example for you and I today. Number one, they recognized their uncleanness and were concerned about the law's requirements. These must have been men that were knowledgeable enough about the law that they said, listen, we've come in contact with a dead body. You know, uh, what, what's the, what, we can't observe the Passover. Uh, what are we going uh, to do? Verse 6 says they were defiled by the dead body of the night. 
And that could have been something, let me just say, that was something beyond their control in some circumstances. I mean, if somebody died, somebody what? Somebody had to, somebody had to bury the body. Somebody had to, to carry the body out of the, out of the house. Somebody may have had to care for that person trying to, to keep them from dying when they died and they came in contact. But this is not a, a, a case of a disrespect for the law. Somebody was going to come in contact with They knew that and they respected God's law. They said, we can't observe it because God has said, as long as you're unclean, why? You couldn't do that. They respected that. And they realized they could not do it. Secondly, they desired to participate in the Passover and offering to God. One of the things that impressed me about these men is they didn't say, well, we're dead. That, that just exempts us. Now, we don't have to worry about that, why? For a year, they wanted to observe the Passover. They wanted to be able to commemorate that, that's why they come to Moses to say, what are we going to do? We want to participate, but we can't participate. And so you see a desire there uh, to worship uh, God, a desire to, to observe that memorial feast. And the third commendable thing I'll say about it is they sought guidance from the proper source. You know, they didn't just simply say, well, I'll tell you what, here's what we're going to do. Since we can't observe it now, we're going to observe it another day. Or we'll just make up our own rules. But they went to the proper source, which was God's representative, Moses. And so with that, these men, that are certainly very, very, very minor Bible characters, serve as an example for us in a respect for God's law, in a desire to worship God, and in a going to the proper source to figure out how to do it in the right way. What? So what did God tell us? God said we're going to make provisions for that. They could observe it in the second month. Two things, though, were important if they were going to observe it in the second month. Number one, when he talked about observing it in the second month, they had to observe it properly, verses 11 to verse 12. In other words, it wasn't a, a watered-down observance, was it? It was, here's what you got to do. You've got to observe it. Then you've got to eat the bitter herbs. You've got to do this. And all that refers back to Exodus chapter 12. So you can observe it in the second month, but number one, it has to be according to the proper instructions. And the second thing, he could not have deliberately missed the Passover. In other words, the second month provision wasn't a provision that's made where I mean, you know what, I'm busy this weekend. You know, I've got, you know, I, I've got things I don't want to do. Uh, kids have ball game, you know. My, you know, they're, 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 there's something else I had been planning for a long time. So we're going to take a what? The second month provision, no. That wasn't what it was for. Really, two conditions are given. Number one, somebody's come in contact with the dead bodies. Or number two, somebody has what? Is gone and, can, and cannot make it back. But here's the point. That provision was never made for a deliberate missing of it when it was within their control what? To do the first one. To do the first one. And those, those are the conditions that, that are met uh, that are met there. Um, any practical lessons we learned from that? Maybe we learned something about the Lord's Supper. Certainly the Lord's Supper was served on the first day of the week. Um, some, some have argued that God made a second provision, therefore we offer it on Sunday night. Whether or not that parallel is perfect or not, I'll say this, that it has to be observed in the right way. And then on the first day of the week, and the, the conditions have to be met. I'll also think, I, say, think we learn a point, and that is that that offering is never for a deliberate what? Miss. That's for things that are beyond somebody's what? Control. Somebody that has sick kids that are sick, somebody that has something that keeps them uh, providentially from being there, but it should never be a thing where what? We just say, well, I'm just going to deliberately miss. I could have been there, I just thought I chose what? I'm not going to be there. Those provisions are not made uh, for that when we assemble together. Maybe a practical lesson there uh, from that. There's also a big consequence. Right. That's right. So, so, you know, these people, these people, as we said, with the provisions that are made for them, they wanted. They wanted. They desired it. It wasn't a matter of them just choosing not to. They wanted to, and God made provision. Uh, for that, we should want to desire to observe the Lord's memorial and 
and it has to be done on the first day of the week the way that God has prescribed. But again, there may, may be a practical lesson that we learned in that about the observance of the Lord's Supper on uh, and the provisions that are made for those who cannot ordinarily be present on the Sunday morning uh, assembly. Uh, the cloud and the fire above the tabernacle. Verses 15 and verse 23. How is God going to guide the people? With cloud. And here's really all that's brought out. This, by the way, had already been said in Exodus chapter 40. Okay? Exodus chapter 40, 34 to 38, had already given details. You've got the cloud by day and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up, what did that tell the people? We're about to move. And, you know, they would, when it settled back down and stopped, that told them to pitch their tents. Now, it didn't matter. God said how long that is. If the cloud comes and the cloud stays, look in verse 21, uh, verse 22, whether it's two days, a month, or what? Or a year. Uh, really, the word year there may not be the best translation. The, the word there is the word, the Hebrew word for day, yom, and it's in the plural, and it really could just be days. In other words, I, I, I don't know of a time where they were God was going to settle it down and they were going to stay what, for a year's time. And that's why uh, some translation, I think it's the English Standard Version, but I could be wrong. Longer Christian Standard, I know that it talks about a day, a month, or what? Or longer. In other words, how, the, the point that God is making is however what? Long the cloud stays, what? That's how long you stay. <laughs> then when it gets up again and it begins to move, then that's what you do. I want you to notice something again. We've noticed this all the way through the book of Numbers. Verse 23, when it talks about, and they kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord, of the Lord by the hand of Moses. The people seem at this point in time, they're still what? Trying to keep God's law. Trying to obey Him just exactly as He has prescribed. Now then we come into chapter 10. And chapter 10 can really be divided into uh, a number of sections. Four. You've got the silver signal trumpets that are made in verses 1 to 10. The instruction for making them the purpose of the trumpets. You've got the order of the march, 11 to 28. The invitation to Hobab in 29 to 32. And then the march begins. It's when they finally begin their journey uh, toward the promised land. The first thing that is given is the instruction on making these two silver trumpets in verses 1 through verse uh, through verse 10. Uh, these are not like the horns or the ram horns that were used on the Day of Atonement. These are silver trumpets. It may be ever seen like in a, uh, in a movie maybe with, where, where royalties, you've got just a long, long trumpet or bugle that sounds an alarm. That's probably much like what these would have, have looked like. The details are given in the first two verses. What was the purpose of these trumpets? Really, five things are said in this text. And what it summons the congregation. Part of this had to do with the, while they were in the wilderness still. That's obviously, when they get in the promised land and they're spread out, what? Over two sides of the Jordan and over all that land, you couldn't go out and sound a trumpet and everybody, what? Knows to come. This particularly has to do at least early on with their, uh, with their use in the wilderness. But verse, uh, he said in verse uh, 2, they are for calling the assembly and directing the movement of the camps. That's the two main purposes. And so, it's some of the congregation. In other words, uh, he, he goes on later here and he talks about in verse uh, 4 that when they blew it only once, that said what? The leaders go. If you blew it twice, down in verse, uh, uh, or when they blow both of them, excuse me, all the assembly was together, when they blew only one, I should say, then they were to, that, that signaled just the leaders were to come. So it, it called an assembly it together. It also signaled the camp Israel was to set out. In other words, when they go out, remember you've got this crowd of what? Maybe two million people. And can you imagine how long it would take if you were trying to send word through the camp we're getting ready to leave? But what they would do is these trumpets were sound. And they probably had different sounds. Depending on what we're doing, maybe, play, maybe longer if it was, a, uh, you know, or shorter if it was a, a calling to an assembly, a longer blow if it was signaling we were going to go out to camp. And uh, many believe what would happen is when they, plus they gave the, the, uh, the signal for the camp to march, there might have been, for example, a long uh, signal of one, and that says, Judah, you leave. And then after that, then they might have sounded two sounds, and that said what? 
Reuben, it's your turn. And everyone, every, every uh, tribe would then leave at their own time. And so that's the reason that it was given. And then also in verse 9, he says, they got there when they were sounding the alarm when Israel went to war, when they were in battle. It's interesting that later on, later on in uh, the, uh, the Bible story, when, when Phineas is going out to battle, I believe, let me find the passage here, it's in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter uh, 31 and verse 6. Moses sent them to war 1,000 from each tribe, and he sent them to the war with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. And so later on, when Phinehas goes to battle, Numbers chapter 31 and verse 6, he takes with him these uh, trumpets because that signaled they were going to battle. Who could blow these trumpets, by the way? He said there, look, Numbers chapter 10, when he said in verse 8, the sons of Aaron, the priests shall blow the trumpets. So they were the only ones that could blow those trumpets, and that's why they're in his care. And then they would be used later on after they come into the land in celebration of the feast that were dedicated to God in verse 10. So we, we have the signal trumpets that are made and what they are, and the order given with regard to them. Then we have in verse 11 through verse 28, we have the marching orders that are given. This is essentially the same as the marching orders given in chapter 2, with one exception. Chapter 2, it seems, gave us sort of a, uh, just a general uh, instruction. In other words, remember that we had six tribes on one side, six tribes on the other, and right in the middle was what? The tabernacle and the Levites. What we learn as we come into chapter 10 that is different is apparently when he talks about the tabernacle being in the middle, that was only a reference to the tabernacle's furniture, like the Ark of the Covenant and those articles that were in the tabernacle. Because what happens here, if you look in verse 17, after the uh, you have the uh, Judah, and then you have the army of the sort of Issachar and all those, then the tabernacle was taken down. The sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari set out carrying the tabernacle. So they actually left before the articles of the tabernacle left, and then they were followed again before, in verse 21, the Kohathites set out carrying the holy things. The tabernacle would be prepared for their arrival. So what happened is, Numbers 2 just simply told us the tabernacle went in the middle. What actually happened, when more detail is given, is sometimes would leave, and then the Merites and the, the Gershites would leave. That's the, the tent itself, the curtains and everything that had to be hung. They would leave. Then some other tribes would leave. And then in the middle would be the furniture of the tabernacle. And the reason it was done that way is so that when the furniture arrived, the tent would already be set up and it would be prepared for the Ark of the Covenant to be taken in, inside of it. So, uh, David Roper says, or Coy Roper, excuse me, says on this passage, the difference between the descriptions of the procession in chapter 2 and 10 is noteworthy. Chapter 2 gives a more general picture of the traveling arrangement. After mentioning that the eastern and southern camp set out, it says the tent of the meeting shall set out of the camp of the Levites in the midst of their camps. It's chapter 2, verse 17. In contrast, chapter 10 is more specific, indicating that the tabernacle was disassembled and carried earlier in the procession, in reality, it was only the tabernacle furniture that was at the central part of that procession. So, that's just the one thing you need to know the difference between chapter 2 and in chapter 10. Then in verse 29 to verse 32, we're introduced to a character by the name of Hobab. Who's Hobab? Okay, it's Moses' brother. Moses' brother. I'll be honest with you, sometimes I forget about Hobab. You know, when I'm reading through the Bible story, and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about him. This is Moses' brother-in-law. Uh, and what happens is Moses in Numbers chapter 10 and verse 29 asked his brother-in-law to come with him. He said, you, uh, you know, you come with me and we'll treat you well. The Lord has promised good things to Israel and you can be part of that. What's Hobab's initial response? I don't want to. I, I don't want to go. I'm going to depart from my old man and 
uh, Moses pleading with him and saying, please don't leave us. You know, you can go with us and you can be our eyes for us. And that you can help us in our journey. Well, one question some of the people ask, and it's a legitimate question, is if the cloud was guiding them, why did they need eyes to help them? The answer might be that the cloud gave them the general direction they were going to go. And that Hobab, being familiar with that area, could take them the best route to get to where the cloud was. You can imagine, by the way, with the two million, and if you saw a cloud in the distance, you may not know exactly what's the best route to get there. You know, that's where I'm headed, but what's in, the, what's in between here and there? You know, you know, if we go this way, we're not going to have to deal with some enemies, or if we go this way, is it going to be easier passing? So it may be that while the cloud guided them in the general direction, that Hobab he said, you'll be good eyes and help take us specifically the best way to go. Interestingly enough, when Numbers chapter 10 ends, we don't have any idea as to whether he went or didn't go with it. But later on, when we go and come into the promised land in Numbers uh, in the book of Joshua, then we read about the family of Hobab uh, being there. Judges 1 and verse 6, the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, could be translated mother-in-law, I mean not mother-in-law, brother-in-law, went up to the city of Palms and the children of Judah into the wilderness which lies to the south near Arad, and there they went and dwelt among uh, the people. And so it seems later on those descendants were there, not mentioned just once, but also in, in, uh, in uh, Joshua chapter 4. So even though Numbers doesn't tell us he went, we conclude from the book of Joshua that apparently after Moses pleading, he decided to go ahead with them. And then finally, at the end of chapter 10, the journey begins. It is in, now, the 20th day of the second month of the second year. How long had they been at Sinai? Yeah. About 11 months, approximately. Uh, they came in the third month of the first year, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 1. And now it is in the second month uh, the second year. So somewhere around 11 months they had been there and they had been making preparation. God had given them the law. He had given them all of these instructions. Now, what happens is now they're going to leave the wilderness of Sinai and the cloud leaves and it settles in the wilderness of Paran. Over here in chapter uh, 10, uh, in chapter 10, when we read about the, 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 their departing, uh, it, it talks about in the cloud went before them. Uh, let me find the exact verse I am uh, I'm looking for. When they get ready to leave, down in verse uh, 12, the children of Israel set out of the wilderness of Sinai on their journeys. Then the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. And then the rest of that chapter is really just talking about the order of the camp, how they left. And so they know they're leaving Sinai, uh, the wilderness of Sinai. My batteries are going dead here, so that that the corner's not going to work. But uh, and, and they're going to be held headed in that direction. You can see it up there at the top, uh, the wall from Aqaba, where the wilderness of Paran is. And that's where they are going to be headed with the journey. What other interesting thing about this journey? As they leave, as they leave, Moses is going to say in verse 35, whenever the ark sets out, rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. So every time they make a journey, and that ark, and the cloud lifts up, and then the ark is, is, is taken up, that's what he is to say. And when it rested, then when it comes back into its place in verse 36, he was to say, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. And so that just a reminder that God was going before them, and that God was with them. We'll talk more about this exodus as we continue through the book of Numbers. Well, when we come to Numbers 11, we really get into the first part of the exciting narrative of Numbers. All, everything up to this point now has been preparation. It's important. Don't dismiss it. Lessons you learn from that. But this is where the book of Numbers really gets, in my mind, exciting. As you see the, the people making their journey toward the promised land, and you see Moses is repeated dealings with these people. And what happens in chapter 11 is they leave Sinai. And now people start complaining. They're at a place called Terebah, which means burning. Uh, its name is given because of what happens here at Terebah. 
And what happens as soon as they start out on this journey toward the promised land, what happens? They start what? They start complaining. Uh, one commentator said, you might be surprised if this is the first time you're reading through the book of Numbers because the book of Numbers, everything up to this point in time, they did exactly what God told them. They were obeying Him. And now we see them acting this way. My thoughts are, if you know Israel and you've read the book of Exodus, you're not surprised because they've already complained. They complained as soon as they crossed over the Red Sea about their water. They already complained about their food on more than one occasion. And so it's not surprising that immediately they began to complain. What are they complaining about in verses 1 to verse 3? You, no, we don't know. What they're complaining about. Now, look in verse 4, they start complaining about me. But verses 1 to verse 3 doesn't tell us what they were complaining about. It just says they complained. Somebody said they were complaining. We've been, a, you know, uh, one commentator speculated that they've been a year at Mount Sinai and other complaining. Our muscles are sore. We're, it, this is a hard journey. We're having to carry all this stuff. This is not. This more. This harder than we thought it was going to be. I don't know exactly what they were complaining about because God didn't tell us what they were complaining about. It just says they complain. A couple of things I need you to notice about that. You need to know in the margin of your mind. Number one, when they complain, what was God's reaction to it? Three things are about Lord. Number one, first of all, the Lord heard. Okay, you know they weren't they weren't necessarily going out and saying, shouting to the heavens, God, we don't like this. But I tell you what, when the man in his tent started complaining to his wife, and everybody started complaining to one another, guess what? God heard it. God always hears our complaint. He always hears when we're grumbling. Whether we're doing it in private, whether we're doing it under our breath, whether we're doing it mentally to ourselves, God knows when we complain and when we grumble. Second thing he said about it is it displeased the Lord. He doesn't like that. Because ultimately when we complain, we're complaining about what God has provided for us. About God's care, about God's provisions. And God is angry about that. So what did God do? He was fired. He sent a fire and it consumed what? Some of the outskirts of the camp. Commentators are divided. You notice in the word some in the New King James, I don't know about in the uh, other translations I should have looked. Uh, it's in italics. So the word some is not really there. It is just he concerned the outskirts of the camp. Some suggest that nobody died in this, that it was sort of God's warning shot. In other words, he consumed some tents, he consumed some... Uh, Maybe some bushes and, and everything in the outskirts of the camp. And it was God's way of saying what? You better watch out. Or something more is going to come. Uh, others, like Kyle and Davis, argue that the outskirts of the camp, that the word camp automatically implies people. And that people died as a result of that. Maybe the outskirts of the camp because that's where the complaining began. Whatever the case was, God wanted them to know what? I'm in control, and, I, and I've heard it, and it needs to stop. One, one thing you learn about Israel, I guess maybe it's a lesson you learn about man in general, they're pretty slow to learn. They're pretty hard-headed. Because when you come into verse 4, what happens immediately? They start complaining again. You know, I, I often say when I read through some of these stories, you would have thought that and said, you know what, we better, we better behave. But they didn't learn. Numbers chapter 16, well, later on we're going to see where God is going to destroy uh, uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, 250 men for complaining and challenging Moses' leadership until the very next day people come back and start complaining again about a bunch more. They just didn't seem to, to learn their lesson. And in this particular case, in verse 4, they begin to complain about their food. And what happens in verse 4 is, is who, by the way, is leading this complaint? The mixed multitude. Who's the mixed multitude? Rabbi was the New American Standard. People from after that, that weren't Israelites, the one reason they talked to the people of Israel. It's probably, it's, it's uh, the mixed multitude, the mixed race of people, uh, probably a, a, a reference to the non Israelites. Uh, some of those came with them out of Egypt, Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, and mixed multitude also went up with them when they left. Uh, do you remember back earlier 
when they had to deal with the situation of the, the, the son that was blasphemous, he had an Israelite mother and what? An Egyptian dad. And so that's probably the mixed multitude or those people that are with them. The word actually that translated the rattle, the, the closest word we would have in our day and time, we refer to, you ever heard somebody refer to as riffraff? Something like that. I mean, they're just sort of what? Yeah, that, 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 they're troublemakers, you know. And, and that's the idea, so that's why the New American Standard translates it as rabble. But they began to complain because they had this intense craving. And so the children of Israel also wept again. It seems to, to start with the, the riffraff, the rabble, the mixed multitude, but it's not long to where it gets into the people of Israel themselves. And they're complaining. What is their complaint? They have no meat to eat. Who's going to give us meat to eat? And then they start looking back to Egypt. And they remember the good old days. You know, uh, what's the problem about the good old days? They're usually not that good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, they're often, as I said, they were, they were good old days, but they're often not as good as we remember them being, are they? You know, when we look back, we tend to remember what? Only the good thing. We, we've sort of edited out, if, if you will, all the, the bad things. And, and it's just interesting to me that when this text multitude, who, by the way, when Israel was leaving, thought, we got to go with them. we got to get out of Egypt. And they leave, and the children of Israel, who had been beaten, and their kids had been killed, and they'd been turned into slaves, now they look back to Egypt, and what do they remember? Food. Fish. And cucumbers and melons and leek. Oh, I just remember how well we ate and, and how wonderful it was. And now in verse 6, our whole being is dried up. I think the American Standard Version says we've lost our appetite. You know, we, 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 now, now we, we don't even have a desire. To eat. All we have out here now is what? Manna. One time they refer to it as this loathsome bread. That's all we have. We've got. And, and it describes the manna there in verse uh, 7. It was uh, like coriander seed. Its color was like the color of bedlam. And people would go out and gather it. And they grind on midst, uh, millstones and beat it in the mortar. And they cooked it in pans and made cakes out of it. And it tasted was like the taste of pastry prepared with all. It doesn't sound all that bad. But I guess if that's all you're getting, what? You might have a desire for something else. And that's the people that are complaining. About what they about what they have. In fact, it gets so bad down in verse ten when Moses hears the people in the camp. What does he hear? Weeping, weeping and crying. You know about lack of gratitude. They hear God is taking them out of Egyptian bondage. God's providing food for them. They're really not having to work for all that much other than go out and gather it in. He's promised them, I'm taking to a land flowing with milk and honey. And these people are in their tents, what? Crying. Weeping because of what's been provided for them. I wonder, we're not a little bit more like Israel than we like to say. How abundantly has God provided for us? Tremendous. Tremendous. I mean, do you ever worry about where your next meal is coming from? And yet, how often in our society is something placed before somebody and the first thing they do is what? Complain about what they've got. We need to learn to be what? Be grateful. Learn to be grateful. Um, I've talked to people that went through times like the Great Depression. They used to like sitting down and say, who are those left down than there used to be? You know, and you know, sometimes they'd eat stuff and I think, there ain't no way I'd eat this. You know what? But when they're hungry enough, they were grateful to get what they... We have so much for... We sit down and we we don't we sometimes don't even think about where our blessings come from. We waste more food than what they Yeah. We waste more food than a lot of people ever dreamed about uh, about hey, don't think anything about throwing it away. Because we know there's gonna be what? There'll be more than But when we complain about what's provided for you know, one of the things that, that God told the the uh, seventy when he sent them out, the Lord did, he sent them out on the limited commission. He said, whatever they put before you, what? Eat it. You know, another like what the Lord was saying is whatever you have put before you, what? Be grateful for it and eat it. And uh, I think we probably do a little bit better than trying to teach people today. Whatever put before you, what? Eat it. And say, thank you. There are people in this world who don't have anything. So maybe sometimes when we think about Israel and we shake our head at them, how could they be that way? 
Maybe we're a little bit closer to Maybe we're a little bit more like that than what we like to realize. But I tell you what, not only did we learn something about this complaining, we learned something from Moses' reaction and God's remedy. Moses hears the people crying and weeping, and so what does Moses do? He gets angry. I think one of the ironic things is you know how Moses can replies to, uh, uh, replies to their complaining? I complain. Yeah. Yeah. They're complaining, and he's saying, that's what does he do? He goes to God and he complains. And commentators divided, and we're not going to get to that whether what he said to him was wrong or not. I think he's discouraged. I think God understood that. And I think God probably understands. Sometimes discouraged people say things they don't really do. So there's not, there's not a rebuke here. But God is going to provide a remedy. What Moses says is, Lord, if, if this is what you have in store for me, then it is, somebody pointed out, remember, Moses didn't want this job to start with. I mean, when God called Moses, God said, well, Moses said what? I'd rather you get somebody else if you could. And now he says, you brought me out. Well, what have I done to you? In verse 11, is in essence what he said. You know, I didn't decide to have all these kids in verse 12. Now, I didn't conceive all these people that I began them that you should want me to carry them along as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers. Tell me, where in the world am I going to go somewhere and get them to make feed these people? How am I going to do that? By the way, when, when you're discouraged and, and sometimes it's the it's the other people that can get you down. You know, you don't think logic. And, and, and I mean by that, that if there's one negative thing to be said about Moses here in this text, besides perhaps his complaining to the Lord, it is the fact that I think he lost sight in that moment of discouragement of what God was capable of doing. Where am I going to get to me? And then later on when God says, I'm going to give him me, Moses says in verse 21, there's 600,000 men on foot. How in the world are you going to feed them? That's not that quote, by the way. But, I mean, that's, that's an essence of what Moses said. You know what Moses had all sight of? What God was capable of. A God, he had seen part of the Red Sea. A God he had seen send frogs and lot. He had seen the power of God demonstrated. I tell you what, in moments like what Moses is facing right here, sometimes we lose sight. What God is capable of in our faith begins to waver a little bit. That's what he, Moses does that because Moses is exhausted. Moses is worn out. Moses is tired of dealing with all of these people. In fact, to the point of what does Moses say? If this is what I've got to look forward to, just go ahead and kill me now. I don't want to deal with it. I shouldn't be surprised, by the way, other great men uttered similar things, whether it was Job or Elijah or Jeremiah in moments of despair, said things very similar to what Moses says here. What's God's remedy to that? you got to learn to what? Trust God. But why don't I give you some men and let's delegate some responsibility? Uh, sometimes we have to learn the hard way. We can't do it what? All on our own. You ever tried to just deal with everything on your own? And I think what it does is it gets you discouraged and frustrated and you don't know where to turn and maybe to the point you just want to give up. So God said, I think what I'm going to do, find what? 70 men and I am going to place the spirit that you have on them. They're going to be able to give instruction. They're going to be able to, uh, to help with uh, things that have to be done. And uh, he says down in, in uh, verse 17, they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you, not might, that you may not bear it yourself along. You try to bear a burden. I don't care what burden it is. You try to bear it on your own. What's going to happen? But you can buckle under the pressure. Uh, I mean, said that sometimes it's hard to ask somebody to help with burden. But, 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 I mean, you pitch the burden being away. You ever going to pick something up and you try to grab it by yourself and it's just what? It's too heavy. But you put somebody else on the other side and what? It can be moved. It's lighter. And I think that's what the Lord proposes. You've been trying to lift that by yourself. Why don't you let somebody else come and try to help you lift that burden? Do some of the things that you've been doing.
And then, not only was he going to provide for the 70 people, he said, Sanctify yourself tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you've wept in the hearing of the Lord. He will give us meat to eat. And he said, I'm going to give you meat. And you're going to eat meat. You're not going to have meat for one day. You're not going to have meat for two days. You're not going to have meat for five days. You're going to have meat for 10, or 10 days or 20 days. I'm going to give it to you for a whole month. In fact, I'm going to give you so much meat. What? It's going to be coming out your nose. And you're going to get what? He said, it's going to come out your nose. And, and it's going to become loathsome to you. You're going to learn to hate the meat. He said, and then you're going to realize what you have done. And because you cried before me and said, why did you ever come out of Egypt? Then when I said Moses, lose sight, because Moses in verse 21 said, do you know how many people there are? How in the world are you going to feed that many people? How many flocks were going to have to be, be killed? There, there did not enough lambs and, and everything around to give them meat and we can't get enough fish out of the sea. How in the world are you going to do it? And this is when the Lord said to Moses, what? In verse 23. The Lord's power limit, literally, has the Lord's arm been short? Uh, now, it is, has, has somebody limited the Lord's power? I mean, do you remember what I have done? Now you shall see whether my word will befall you or not. Sort of like God just says, now, just sit back, what? Watch. See what I do. So Moses, then in verse 24, goes out and gathers the 70 people and God places His Spirit upon them. But there are two men out of the 70 that were, did not come, Eldad and Medad. Now, I'll say this. Not a lot is said about why they didn't come. Okay, why they didn't come. Not a lot is said about that. But they didn't come and they began to prophesy. And so a young man comes and tells that these men are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, comes to Moses and says, What? Should I tell them what? Should I tell them stop that? Should I forbid them from doing that? And Moses says, What? I wish everybody could prophesy like that. It, it, it reminds me of a couple of stories in the scripture. Number one, do you remember... Uh, in Mark 9, not all that long ago in our scripture reading, Mark chapter 9, when the disciples saw somebody performing miracles and they told the Lord about it and they said, we found one that was not with us performing miracles and we told him what? Stop it. And, and the Lord made, reproved them and said basically, if he's not against us, then he is. He's with us. The fact that we're performing miracles was signs that what? God was with them. Let him go. Let him do that. And so Joshua's reaction is initially the same. Moses said, I wish everybody could do that. You know, Moses' attitude reminds me of that of the Apostle Paul when he thought about people preaching the gospel in Philippians chapter 1. He said, I'm ready for the gospel to be preached. I don't care where the source is. We're not in competition with one another. That's the point. It's not about, well, if he's prophesying that people aren't listening to me, if he's doing this, people aren't paying attention. We're not in competition. We're fellow laborers. Moses understood that. And so you, you appreciate, by the way, the statement that's made over in chapter 12, the very next chapter, which we're not going to get to this, this morning, we're talking about Moses was what? More humble than any man on the face of the earth? I think when I think about that, I come back to this statement here where Moses said, I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I wish everybody could do what I do. And he wasn't concerned about self. He wasn't concerned about Moses. He was concerned about leading the people. That's number Two, right? Is that number one? All right. One of these days, I'll learn to pay attention. And number two, then, then the quail of sin. I should really have uh, probably uh, included 26 to 30 in a separate outline, but, but I didn't. But God sends the quail among the people. How many quail does He send? An abundance. Uh, he says enough that if you look out from the camp, if you're in the camp and you look out and you say, that's how much we go in a day's time, is what he saw. What? A day's journey this way, a day's journey that way. They were surrounding the camp all around. How deep were they? Two cubits deep uh, is what the New American Standard uh, says. 
And I think that's probably the correct answer. Some say that they flew two cubits above the ground. I think it's more likely that they were two feet, uh, two cubits deep. How much is a cubit? Is it what? About 18 inches. So two cubits is the equivalent of what? 18, 18 36. That's how many feet? Three feet. Three feet. So you've got, what, three feet deep. Play all the way around. And in other words, God provided not just what they needed, He provided what? An abundance of quail. And the people stayed out all day that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered quail and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. And while the meat was still between their teeth, what happened? God struck them with a great plague. Just because God gives you something doesn't necessarily mean God what? Approves. God gave them meat, but He didn't approve of their disposition or their attitude. And here these people died with the meat still between their teeth. And He called the name of that place Kerbroth Hadaba in verse 34 because they buried the people who yielded to craving. In other words, that idea there is they gave in to their lust. And as a result of that, they were punished. And then they moved from there, uh, from Kerbroth Hadaba, they moved to Hazaroth and camped at Hazaroth. What do you learn from that? Practical application you can make from that story. The people's complaint, first of all, at uh, Terabah and then at Kerbroth had a had it. Be grateful for what you have. Be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. In that case, they did, and they paid a severe, they paid a severe uh, price uh, for it. Do what? The Lord's not someone to mess with. No, you don't want to just want the Lord to displease him. He can, he, he, he can uh, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the, uh, the living uh, God. You certainly learned that in, in that story. What else? Uh, You know, he does. He, he got, nothing's hidden from the eyes of God. All things are naked open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. I think, I, think I, I learned a lesson, not just in this text, but really throughout Israel's journey, is the importance of keeping our eyes on where we're going instead of looking back to where we've been. You know, part of their problem was is they're making their journey to the promised land. Which way are they looking? They're looking back. And they keep thinking about Egypt. And when they think about Egypt, all they're remembering is the good things about it. What if they kept their eye focused on the promise? You contrast Israel with Abraham, who the Bible said could have called to mind the country in which he, was, uh, he had come, but instead he kept his eyes focused on not just Canaan, but heaven. That's where he was trying to go. And because of that, he was able to make great sacrifice and endure great, great things. And that, there's a lesson in that. For if, if we're looking back, or even looking down, as folks are looking up and forward, what's going to happen to us? We're going to get discouraged. First of all, we're not going to properly remember things. You know, somebody that obeys the gospel, and then they keep looking back longingly to, you know what, I can remember back when I used to do this, and I could do that. Well, they're going to go back. They're going to go back. Somebody that's focused right on, the, on, on what's immediately in front of them. The Bible talks about being nearsighted. And uh, being nearsighted means I can see clearly right here. I, for a long time, I was nearsighted. Now I need help reading too with my glasses. But you know, when I was nearsighted, I could look far away and everything was sort of fuzzy. But nearsighted, everything's what close up. It's all clear. And some people live their lives that way. They're focused on the right now, as opposed to focus on where they're going. You know what happens if you're always looking down? You about to stumble, aren't you? As opposed to look about where you need to be going. So I think there's a lesson we need to learn about our focus and what contributed to the complaint, as opposed to just the complaint itself.